There's a house in a terraced street in Ponder's End, North London, where the events of the past two months have baffled all who've heard about them and scared the life out of those who've been directly involved. This is the home of Mrs. Peggy Hodgson and her family. At the moment, the children are being looked after by relatives because Mrs. Hodgson is ill in bed. The sequence of bizarre happenings which unfolded round these children and their mother in September have made the walls of the house rattle with the impact of flying objects and the sound of mysterious knockings. Soon a second family was drawn into the action, the next door neighbours, Peggy and Vic Nottingham. We'd been sitting listening to the knocking and uh, the woman next door, she called me in. I, we couldn't make out what it was. I heard the knocking as I walked in the front door, but we, I went all over the house, checked it, checked the walls, checked everything. Just couldn't make out what it was. So in the end, I thought, well, there's only one thing I'll call the police. One of the two police officers sent to investigate made the following remarkable statement about what they heard and saw in this living room. There were four distinct taps on the wall and then silence. About two minutes later, I heard more tapping from a different wall. The other police constable checked the walls, attic and pipes, but could find nothing to explain the knocking. The eldest son of the family pointed to a chair next to the sofa. I then saw the chair slide across the floor. It moved approximately three to four feet and then came to rest. I checked the chair, but could find nothing to explain how it had moved. The police definitely wanted to get out of the house. How so. could you tell? David's <laughs> as frightened as I was. <laughs> and then the second night we went back in there again and we got the same reactions again. We got this knocking. And then um, this here Lego. I, I, I witnessed a box of Lego underneath a chair, but I walked into the room. As I walked into the room, the Lego began to fly. But where it was coming from, I don't know. One piece hit me on the arm. And, um, Did it hurt? Oh, it, it brought a lamp up. It caught me on the elbow and it brought a lamp up. And as well, I one say, tiny little piece? One of... tiny little piece of Lego. Now, it's, it's not much bigger than a three quarters of an inch. But it caught me on the elbow. And as I say, it brought a lamp up. In the absence of a law against chairs that move on their own, the police were powerless to act. So the neighbours called in the man from the Society for Psychical Research. Maurice Gross is an inventor who devotes his leisure to investigating the supernatural. Since coming on the case, he's made several recordings of what he says are unique examples of a poltergeist in action. Tapes can, of course, be faked. But in this one, recorded in a bedroom after the family had gone to bed, the reactions of the Hodgson children to some very strange occurrences seem totally genuine. The light plug was pulled from the socket three times after that. Then, after a period of watching and waiting, something even stranger happened. Who's that shaking the door? Oh. What's that? Mum's laughing. Oh! What's that? The slipper was thrown across the room and hit oh, the not door my one. as I was holding the door. My one. What sort of a case is this in your experience? Well, I think this is probably the best case this century. In fact, as far as documentation is concerned, it may be the best case of all time. What special aspects make it so? Well, the, the entity itself has been very, very violent at times and of course the witnesses and the documentation have been excellent the violent uh, violent things i've seen happen are the uh, 
the, the furniture moving, the furniture being thrown upside down. In fact, uh, one night I was standing here, there were about 11 or 12 people in the room and I was standing talking to one of the members of the family and I, in front of the settee and the settee went straight up in the air and turned upside down, right in front of me, no more than a foot away from me. What particular tape stands out in your mind? Well, I think one particular tape that stands out in my mind is uh, the incident where I was communicating with it quite a long while, very seriously, and then something happened which was very funny indeed. Knock one for no and two for yes. Are you a male spirit? One for no and two for yes. You are a male spirit. Did you used to live in this house? You did. Was it, was it more than 50 years ago? Yes. Did you, did you die in this house? Did you pass on? You did pass on in this house. Now why are you here? Are you unhappy? You're not unhappy, but why are you here? Is it because you want to give us a special message? No, you don't want to give us a special message. Are you having a game with me? Oh, oh right. Oh, oh. As I ask the, as I ask the question, are you having a game with me? It threw, it threw the, the cardboard box and the pillow right at my face. Well, thank you very much. That was a very good answer. And we was all just standing in the kitchen, all of us together. And then all of a sudden, a pool of water come from nowhere in the middle of the floor in the kitchen. And then we heard the toilet chain pull. And there was no one at all out in the toilet. We was all in the kitchen. And the door opened in the toilet. Then the chain went. And as we walked out there, the toilet brush came from the the thing what it was in the toilet. container and it, the brush just come up and settled on top of the toilet just like that as if someone had just got in there pulled the chain and then took the brush up and to wash the toilet and the doors well and then the bathroom door opens and the, uh, the kitchen table has just tipped up and there's Janet one of the girls she's been just sitting on the chair and she's been thrown completely across the room is a, a child's chair, I suppose it weighs about 10 pounds, padded one with metal legs. And the child is sleeping in a single bed one side of the room, and I was sitting on a single bed the other side of the room, with his chair in the middle. The child went to sleep, and all of a sudden she got a little bit restless. Well, just after that, his chair was lifted off the ground, and it was thrown about nine foot through the air, a good nine foot, for no reason whatsoever. No one was on the end of it. Didn't touch no one. Just went a straight line down the room. And what did you do? <laughs> I ran out the room again. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you see these things, there's nothing on the end of them. You forget to shake. <laughs> the third family to be caught up in the story was John and Sylvia Burkham, who live a few doors away. John is Mrs. Hodgson's brother, and he and Sylvia have spent hours at the Hodgson's house, trying to help them through all the unexplained goings on. But they've had plenty of shocks of their own. Now what happened in this bedroom? Well, I heard a noise downstairs. I come up and there was the eldest girl on the floor, but the other one's missing. So I look under this bed, I look under this one, and as I stand up, I see it. There she is, across this radio, one leg in the air, and her head hanging down. Just to prove that I wasn't mad, I yelled for my wife to come up to see what I have just seen. But she was asleep. As a roof repairer, Vic Nottingham is used to tall stories. But he never thought he'd play a leading role in one like this. I've got one chap at work, for instance, and he says to me, how's your ghost, Gidman? Now, I mean, it's, it's no good talking to a chap like that. 
because he, he's got no reaction on it whatsoever. He thinks that I'm going around the bloody bend like, you know what I mean? But, um... Do you think you are? <laughs> well, I was straight. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 44 and I, I've, I've never witnessed anything like it before in my life, but... The only thing that worries me, see, being a roofer by trade, is beginning to get on top of you. you your nerves begin to shatter a little bit. In every story of things that go bump in the night, there are two possibilities. One, that it's a hoax. Two, that there's something going on beyond the grasp of the human mind. If this is a hoax, it means that some of the 17 people who've seen things have been playing an elaborate and twisted joke on the others. If it isn't a hoax, it means that either those 17 people have all been having hallucinations, including the police, or this is the best documented ghost story of all time. Can you tell me why you are upsetting this family? Is it because you enjoy doing it? You do enjoy doing it. But I suggest that now you've got... Now, what does that mean? Why, why have you done three knocks? Now, now I ask you the question again. Two knocks for yes and one lock for no. Now, yes, that's right, you understand. Now, do you enjoy upsetting this family? You do. Well, now, will you please go away? Because I think you've had enough of your jokes. You won't go away. But I would like you to go away and go away because... I think you've been upsetting this family long enough and it's time you went away. Do you understand me? Please go away. Yes, you must go away. It's absolutely essential that you go away. No, you mustn't be obstinate. You must go away. Well, you must. I'm sorry, but you must stop annoying this family. You've had enough. You've had a good time. Now, please go away. All right? Please go away. I can't say any more to you now. Goodbye. Goodbye. These teenage sisters believe they're haunted well. by a poltergeist. I was going to ask the same question as I asked earlier. How many voices are there? Six hundred. Six hundred of the voices. I know the joke. How many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had ten. Three. Um, sensible voices, but the rest of the names are absolute rubbish. Eleven-year-old Janet Hodgson appears to be the focus of many of the strange happenings in Green Street. But they also affect her 14-year-old sister, Margaret, and their younger brother, Billy. One of the first manifestations was when Lego bricks began to fly at high speed around the living room. How does it feel to be haunted by a poltergeist? It's not haunted. Why isn't it haunted? I don't know. I'll Does it frighten you, the things that happen here? Oh, well, it did first, but now I've got more oh, used to it. And you learn to accept the things that happen. It slung a cupboard at Mum. My it at Mum. Slung a bookshelf at Mum. Yeah. Have you tried telling it to go away? Yes, yeah, many times. No, I don't know. And uh, what does it reply? Mm. No, it won't. It's staying another six, seven years. The local police could find no explanation for the knocking either. They were even more baffled when two of their beat constables reported seeing an armchair levitate across the Hodgson's living room. It um, came off the floor, or nearly a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet, before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't. It didn't roll at all. 
Um, I checked for wires under the cushion, the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. Maurice Gross is an electronics engineer and an investigator for the Society for Psychical Research. Over here was Janet, and over here, in this bed here, was Margaret. It was in the same bedroom a month later, with all the family present, that Maurice Gross first challenged the poltergeist to talk. And this was actually the result. You'll hear here uh, the whistling, first of all, and then the barking. And here is this noise. The barking here is quite extraordinary, actually. I then said to it, I then, uh, as I said on the tape here, I then said to it, if you can whistle and bark and groan, then you can talk. And I asked it to actually say my name. I want you to call out my name, my complete name, Morris Gross. See if you can do that. Hello. 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 Very good. Let me hear you say my name again. Come on, let me hear you say my name. Come on, my name's Morris. Let me hear you say it. Morris. Now that was the first time we heard the voice, and since then we've been hearing it again and again, and it's been getting louder and louder. What about the voices? When, when did the voices start? December the 12th. December the 12th? Yes. And how did this start? Well, one night Mr. Grove was talking about it, about 8 30. He said, All we need now is a voice to talk. And that night I went to bed and I can't remember exactly what happened. And What's that knocking? Yeah, that's you can hear it now. I was doing that yesterday morning and Peggy was on her own. So she came in to us because you know, it wasn't her, she came in. We sat together and we heard it. And I counted down my knocks and there was fourteen altogether. And it's doing it again now. That was three knocks just now? Yes, it goes in threes and twos. Now we first got contacted this was when Mr. Gross said, if there's anyone there, not twice, but yes, and if not, one for now. I wonder if we did that now, whether it would answer. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? It doesn't always do it to order. No, it doesn't. It goes in spasms. Like we're talking now, it may not now after you've said that, but you won't do it when you want it to straight away. No. What about the voices? They sometimes um, say things and make answers. Mm. Is that the voice now? Yeah. Is anybody there? How many voices are there? No. Dirty Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart Thurton. Dirty Dick, Andrew Gardner, and Stuart, Stuart Thurton. Thurton. Oh, has he ever spelt that for you? No. 
Mr. Ghost asked him, but it's like you struck Mr. Ghost last night when you asked. Or some time ago. And Sorry. what what do you Go think on. these are? Are they people or are they just voices? Could be spirits, oh, I don't know. I believe it's a ghost or spirit speaking for us somehow. No. We don't get this at school these voices are. Because I'll be when we're all separate, it's not so strong. Just when you come near each other? Yeah, like here, or our aunts, we will up there together, or in Peggy's next door. And Janet, your voice is stronger, isn't it? It seems mm -hmm. to be the strongest. Yeah. Does, when you hear the voice, and it comes out, where does it come from? Here, in your throat? No. Where do you feel it comes back from? Back of the neck. Mm, back of the neck. And so it must be as if it's somebody else speaking then, when you hear yeah, it? Yeah, behind us. And do you get the feeling when you hear the voice that there is a person there? Yes. Yeah. And do they tell you much about themselves? Not really, no. They just tend to growl and... Play around and sort of joke and be silly. You know. I wonder, do you think there's anyone there just now? Yeah. I do. Who's that? What? Who's that, Janet? Pardon? Who? Stuart. Sir. Stuart certain and he's one of the voices. Yeah. Why do you think he comes and speaks through you? To noise, to annoy us. Does he ever say anything nice? Well don't know really. Shall we so try and speak to him? No. We'll see if he'll speak to us. Yeah. Is anybody there? No, no. Who's there? Doctor Who. Doctor Who? Choices here. Mr. Gross, a lot of people hearing these voices produced by the children will mm -hmm. simply say that they are very good ventriloquists mm -hmm. and that this is all a hoax. Mm -hmm. How would you react to that? Certainly not. Um, they're, they're certainly not very good ventriloquists. We have had tests on them to see whether they can ventriloquise. They can't. Um, to keep up this particular type of voice, for any length of time without damage to the vocal cords is absolutely impossible. I mean, there must be some hoarseness attached to it. But don't forget, these children don't do this for a couple of minutes or so. They do it for lengths of periods up to three hours and without any hoarseness or sore throats whatsoever. Well, Pat's guy, Pat, you've got something to say to them. Yeah. I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Janet's vocal cords to pieces. If I do yeah. it for half a minute, I get a sore throat. Joe? Guy Lyon Playfair is an author of books on the paranormal, with experience well, of poltergeist cases in this. Europe and Brazil. How do you do it, mate? God, they can cowards. Don't you ever get a sore throat, Janet? No. Sure? Yeah. You never get pain in the back of the neck or something? No. Mm. Oh, what do you mean? I, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not with you. What? Well, oh, you're right. with me now? With you? Um, it's just in the back of my neck, yeah. Well, tell us about that. I don't know No, tell me, about, tell me about that. You get it, you get it now? It's buzzing in well, the back of the neck. Yeah. Do you feel it vibrating as if it was sort of... Um, no, like someone... Someone what? Got their hand on the back of my neck, like that. Mm. Poltergeists seem to thrive on an atmosphere of tension that is partly sexual. The fact that most of the focuses are adolescents 
seems to contribute to the mischievous nature of the effects, leading some to suggest that the kids are faking or enjoying a laugh at the expense of the investigators. But to create all the bizarre effects that went on in this house either involves a gigantic conspiracy with the neighbours or a disruption in our laws of mind and matter. Invisible. I'm invisible. You're invisible? Why are you invisible? I'm a G H O S T. Because I'm a G H O S T. Yes, he had quite a sense of humour. He also used to swear a lot as well. I'm Maurice Gross and I'm one of Britain's leading psychic investigators. I'm 76 now and still on the trail of ghosts and poltergeists. In 1977, I led a team which investigated what is now regarded as the world's most famous poltergeist case, the Enfield Poltergeist. It became world headlines at the time, mainly because of the strange, gruff voice that came from a girl called Janet. Hollywood soon got in on the act, and the makers of several box office hits acknowledge a debt to my case in Enfield. I've never been able to forget that voice. He called himself many names, but mostly Bill or Fred. I still listen to the 180 hours of tapes I recorded during the investigation. This voice is coming from an 11 year old girl. Well, perhaps, Guy, perhaps you've got something to say to them. Yeah. I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Janet's vocal cords to pieces. If I do it for half a minute, I get a sore throat. There's chases here. And we found that on analysis, the voice was not made by the larynx, the voice box, but by the false vocal fold, which is above the larynx. And you only use that when you lose your voice and you talk like that. Well, if you talk like that for more than a couple of minutes, you start getting a sore throat. Talk like that for five minutes or so, and you're going to start doing damage to your throat. And yet this voice used to speak up to three hours at a time. Not continuously, of course, but up to three hours at a time without the girl showing any distress at all. Absolutely remarkable. The voice was just part of it. The girl levitated, going from horizontal to vertical, in a sixth of a second, furniture was thrown around the rooms, the house was swarming with journalists. But after four days, they were baffled and frightened and called my team for help. A policewoman gave a sworn affidavit of the extraordinary activity she witnessed. Even the ghost chipped in. The death certificate confirmed the truth of what the ghost was saying. Many objects materialized out of thin air, spoons were bent, fires broke out spontaneously in the impoverished family's home. The family had to endure practically every known phenomena in a poltergeist case. They were traumatized. They didn't benefit financially and were ostracized by many of their local community. The Enfield poltergeist menaced that family for 18 months. It nearly destroyed their lives. I'm going back to see them for the first time in 20 years. Janet, the girl at the center of it all, prefers to remain anonymous but I spoke to her mother and sister. Well, here I am at this uh, famous house uh, in Enfield, and uh, here you see Margaret and her mother, who were very, very involved in this case. Do you remember the day I first came? Yes, I remember, yeah, Mr. Gross, remember and, and, Mr. and you Gross. was on the case ever since then, yeah. yes. onwards, and you saw everything mm -hmm. and took note and explained to us 
You remember when the reporters and journalists were here, how did they carry on? I could see the fear in some of their faces also and they probably could sense that we was dead scared and wanted to run out any minute. I know I did. I rem- My sister did, I know that. I remember one of them came in and he explained to me that I'd got a poltergeist in the house. And, and I said, well, I know it's that. And I nearly fainted when he told me. I didn't even know what it was. In fact, I don't think any of us did. And we couldn't even until say the word poltergeist until Mr. Groves from the Psychical Research explained how to say poltergeist. That's me, that's me. <laughs> and, and, and also what it actually meant in, was it German? Was it? Yeah, it, it, it poltergeist, was, noisy. It was, Noisy noisy spirit. In the meeting noisy of it spirit. also, yeah. which he explained to us. What do you say to people who say to you, with you children playing around, what do you say well, about that? I'd say that's a matter of opinion. If you haven't experienced it, you're going to say that. But it did really happen. It upsets me deep down to think that they can't give us an open mind, the ones that just put it down completely. But all I can say to them is I wish they could experience the same thing as what we went through. They certainly wouldn't say it was false or a fake or it was child playing or, or anything of that kind. The welfare of people at the centre of poltergeist activity is very important. I believe that most poltergeist activity is actually caused by very high levels of stress. Occasionally you get paranormal entities interacting with this. And this is what I think happened at Enfield. I haven't spent all my years searching for the paranormal. Like everybody else, I had a normal life to lead. When I left school, I was a commercial artist. I did two years apprenticeship. You can see on the pictures on the wall, well, actually, they are my pictures that I have done. I turned into quite a good commercial artist, in fact. But then, The war was looming, and I joined the Royal Artillery. Super heavy guns. We had to make a hasty retreat back to Dunkirk, when, of course, thousands of other troops. And we were bombed and blitzed to hell there. It really was rough going. I suppose I was one of the reasonably lucky ones. I got off on a destroyer. I met Betty at a tea dance in Marble Arch. Oh, I was very taken with her, right, and work go. And uh, it was on a Sunday, and I met her on a Sunday, proposed to her on the Thursday, and in ten weeks we were married. Because everybody said at the time, oh, these war marriages, it would never last, it would never last. Well, I don't know, perhaps it won't. I mean, it's only 51 years now, so I suppose. <laughs> I think I can say it, it last. Right. We've had a good life until the death of our youngest daughter, Janet, in a road accident. Betty and I believe that Janet tried to contact us after her physical death. You might believe that was just our way of dealing with bereavement, but it was a turning point in my life. I decided to carry out serious research into the paranormal and join the Society for Psychical Research. This is now my psychic HQ. The Society is the world's leading centre for the scientific study of the paranormal. I'm the chairman of the Spontaneous Phenomena Committee. People write to us from all around the country with their strange cases, which we investigate on a non-fee-paying basis. Can you recap on who he said was psychologically disturbed? He said what what like name? Of who was it? Because there's so many names the covering came up. letters, isn't oh, it? Covering yes, on the covering yeah. letter. There's so many people mentioned yes, I was there. Wondering that. Expert in the early 60s and a retired university lecturer. Well, I think we can dispense with that case then, yeah.